We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Ladies and gentlemen, greetings everyone. And thank you for joining this session on Best Practice Forum on Cybersecurity from wherever you are in the world, online or on site here in Katowice. I'm Jung Bunen, I'm a MAG member and facilitator of the BPF Cybersecurity. Special greetings to the several hubs with us, particularly the hub of Madagascar from the University of Ilzun. First of all, I would like to remind that our session is fully hybrid, so do not hesitate to share comments or thoughts on Zoom. For those who are with us here, you will be able to have the mic and take the floor. That said, I'm honored to introduce this session today. Now, I would like to give the floor to Marcus Kummer, who is co-facilitating the BPF with me. Over to you, Marcus. Thank you, Marona. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, wherever you are. It's a great pleasure to be here. I would like to just to say a few introductory words to put the IGF, the BBF, BPF on cybersecurity into the broader IGF perspective. As you will recall, the BPFs were reintroduced in 2014 with the objective to produce more tangible outcome. This has been a very frequent criticism of the IGF that it did not produce outcomes. And the BPF on cybersecurity clearly has produced outcomes. Uh, it was uh, started in 2016 with evolving focus, and Martin will tell us more on that. And it has produced um, outputs every year and also shared them with the broader community, also with intergovernmental processes, such as the open-ended working group in the United Nations. And right now, I think there's much talk on the future of digital cooperation. We have the Secretary General's roadmap, we have the digital on digital cooperation, we have the global digital compact on the horizon, and uh, the IGF plus, which is supposed to fit into that. And there are calls, and the Secretary General has called for a more inclusive, focused, relevant, and outcome-oriented BPF. The BPFs, I think, in general, fit into this uh, scheme. And this BPF on cybersecurity, in particular, as it has been very focused and very relevant. And with that, I hand back to uh, Martin, who is moderating the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcos, and thank you everyone for attending today's uh, Best Practices Forum on Cybersecurity, our uh, final meeting of the year. Um, as Marcus has mentioned, this uh, BPF has had a wealth of history. Um, we've been at it for several years, uh, but the last few years specifically, we have focused on the topic of cyber norms. And I will actually try to briefly share with you what that history looks like. Okay, I am hoping all of you can see this at this point in time in the room and virtually. Today is December 10th, 2021. Uh, we will be covering a few topics today. Uh, first of all, I will briefly introduce you to the work that we did over the last year. We will then have a session um, or an overview of the work that happened um, in one of the two work streams focused on assessing international cybersecurity norms. Um, and we will have a deep dive into a secondary topic where we tested cyber norms against historical cybersecurity events. And finally, we'll have a very wide panel session on several of these topics in more detail. But to give you that historical perspective that I mentioned earlier, in 2018, the Best Practices Forum started first looking at the idea of norms. And we did that not so much rooted in the 
ongoing discussion at the time around cyber norms, but we really stepped back to seeing what culture norms and values meant to different stakeholders. And we looked at the different um, norms development mechanisms that existed in the places where cyber norms were being developed. We found that a lot of those were state driven, but that there was actually also a lot of emerging development happening in the technical community in civil society that we should not discard. In 2019, we then really looked at norms oper operationalization. How do norms actually get put into practice and how do organizations that sign up to these individual agreements actually internalize the discussion there to make sure that the norms actually hold value as opposed to simply being words. And that year, we also started taking a very wide look at cross-stakeholder agreements um, that existed in the norm space. So we started looking at normative agreements that had participants from many different stakeholder groups and how they actually worked together, how they convened and what they ended up writing out as they put letters to these common understandings that were developing and cascading through the community. In 2020, we took a look at normative principles in global governance. So what we really did that, that year was we looked at the very wide history of social norms and how they actually affected different types of governance outside of cyber. So we looked at uh, norms around nuclear uh, materials. We looked at various different areas to understand how norms had been effective in other parts of the global community and how we could learn from that when we develop and think through cyber norms. And so we got to this year and really spent a lot of time thinking through where can we add the most value um, in terms of continuing this line of research. And what we discovered was that um, as norms were developing, there started to be some commonalities between these different normative agreements. And we started wondering where do those commonalities come from? What are the drivers? And in particular, we had a thesis that norms are inspired by real life cybersecurity events. And we use the word event instead of incident because not necessarily every particular event that may have resulted in a norm developing would have been a cybersecurity incident. It, we wanted to leave it open that some of these events that led to impacts could actually be disclosures of vulnerabilities, discussions, things that wouldn't always fit everyone's definition of an incident, but that would have fairly widespread impact on the community, or at least required us to change our ways in certain uh, perspective. So we brought together three different work stream groups. Um, first of all, we focused on understanding the different agreements that were in place. This work, as I mentioned earlier, we had actually been doing for three years. So we simply continued that initiative and uh, John Herring and Pablo Hinojosa, uh, John who unfortunately uh, is in another session right now and Pablo is here representing this uh, work stream, started together with a group of volunteers to look at all the different normative documents out there, make a selection on the ones that were most impactful from the perspective of these cybersecurity events and started analyzing what some of the patterns and the commonalities between these agreements are and most uh, interestingly, also look at the things that were less common and that were more unique or less mentioned across these different agreements. Um, over the years, we've gradually been increasing the amount of agreements we cover from um, around 20 to today, 36 normative documents that were looked at this year. A second work stream led by Mallory Nodal uh, looked at the historical cybersecurity events. They started by compiling a list of major cybersecurity events over the last 20, 30 years, um, and then started diving deep in a much smaller amount through qualitative questioning and really trying to answer the thesis, how would a specific norm have been effective at mitigating this adverse cybersecurity event? Both of these groups have published papers which are in draft and which are available from the Best Practices Forum uh, on Cybersecurity website. So you can find both of those documents on our website, accompanied by a short two-pager that um, I really recommend reading if you don't have time for the full documents. And finally, we had a work stream that was led by Sheetal Kumar and uh, Marcus Kummer. 
who have been working on outreach. They've been engaging with other organizations, other bodies to understand how can we bring some of what we're learning here to the wider community and get greater value from it. And also how can we bring new participants into the best practices forum to work together on these issues and uh, get more high quality analysis of the situation that is really emerging in this very complex cybersecurity world. So if I would have to summarize and the work that we have focused on this year, it is really about identifying how the rules of the road actually meet the rubber of the road. So where is it that these rules are truly taking effect and where are they having value? Where are the challenges? And this is what our team spent this year analyzing. Now, with that, I mentioned that we have a really interesting session coming up. Um, I'll hand it over shortly to Pablo Hinoosa and Eneken Dick, who will talk about the mapping analysis that they performed of international cybersecurity norms agreements. We'll then go into that really interesting analysis of how have these norm concepts actually held up against cybersecurity events. And if we take more newer norms and we apply them to these older events, what do we learn? And then finally, we'll go into a panel um, and enrich the conversation about these two topics with as goal to take what we learn here today from our esteemed panelists, from the different volunteers that worked on this effort and from all of you and bring that back into our final uh, papers that we will publish after the conclusion of the Internet Governance Forum. So again, thank you so much for being here today. It is you who makes this effort worthwhile, and it is you who helps us make this as effective as it can be. So we really greatly appreciate your time, and we hope that you find what we have to share here today interesting. Thank you for joining, and Pablo, I will hand it over to you for the next part of this session. Martin, thank you. It's always such a pleasure to be here uh, with you, although not much from a dark office in Brisbane, Australia. Well, it'd be nicer to be in Katowice, uh, close to many of you. So I am going to present uh, some of the findings from the Workstream 1, and I want to just make sure that you can see my uh, presentation and uh, can I confirm that you are seeing the the proper slide? I think I can see that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, it's Anakin and myself uh, talking about the the work of the Workstream One that Martin kindly introduced. I'm going to talk about the quantitative part of the study, and Anakin has done a really good job in adding sort of quality uh, and texture to uh, this work. Um, this work has uh, been mostly led by John Herring uh, that unfortunately had a collision in his IGF schedule with a workshop that he's organizing uh, probably in a room close to this one. Um, so I'm going to tried to do justice to um, sort of the work that he led. Uh, however, there were a very good number of uh, volunteers uh, that uh, pull up uh, most of the work uh, for this work stream. And, and this was really a best effort, voluntary um, uh, type of work, which was crowdsourced and, and well uh, organized uh, by um, John. So recognition to, to him here. So uh, as Martin said, we continue to uh, unpack a collection of uh, norms. Uh, and and Workstream uh, 1 was tasked with the uh, mapping and analysis of, of, of these norms and agreements. And um, something that is worth to remember is how uh, the best practice forum collected these uh, agreements. Um, so there was a special criteria and, and we thought, well, um, these have to be uh, firstly uh, international in scope. Uh, they have to uh, um, absolutely have a mission to improve uh, the overall state of cybersecurity. And uh, this recommendation should apply to all um, group signing these uh, agreements. And, and something that is very important is that this collection of uh, agreements 
uh, does not include treaties or conventions or other legally binding um, uh, agreements between countries. Uh, we uh, only focused on uh, voluntary non-binding uh, norms for cybersecurity. So these are the collection of norms so far that we have been analyzing. And uh, I think it's a, a very good collection. Uh, we increased the number uh, from the previous report. Uh, in, in 2020, there were 22 agreements. And um, nowadays, we have 36 agreements to work on. Uh, these agreements are either multilateral, uh, and, and um, these are the, the UN agreements, such as the uh, 2015 report of the uh, uh, group of governmental experts or the recent um, open-ended working group agreements. Um, the other big category is single stakeholder, uh, mostly um, governmental, uh, but uh, there are also industry um, uh, agreements such as the Cybersecurity Tech Accord uh, or the uh, Freedom Online Coalition's uh, recommendations. Um, and of course, importantly, there are uh, cyber norm efforts uh, that have been uh, agreed in a multi-stakeholder setting. Um, they, they are not the majority of them, um, but um, they, there are important efforts there, such as the Paris Call for Trust and Security, the Siemens Charter of Trust, uh, of course, the Global Commission on the, uh, on the Stability of Cyberspace um, uh, norms, and um, we included here as well the contract from, for the web of the World Web Web foundation. So this is the collection of, of norms. This is our data set. Uh, and, and we try to make progress uh, on analyzing these. Um, so um, in the previous report, I hope you have read it in 2020, um, the idea was to map uh, most of these agreements to the 11 uh, most famous uh, norms from the uh, UN uh, governmental group of experts in their 2015 report. But this time, uh, we improved the framework, the analytical framework, and uh, we came up with basically uh, six categories uh, of, of, of norms. Um, uh, so we divided in, in rights and freedoms, information security and resilience, reliability of products, cooperation and assistance, restraint on developments and use of cyber capabilities, and uh, technical and, and operational. And uh, from these six categories, uh, there, there were more detail, uh, um, up to 26 uh, specific norm elements uh, that um, volunteers uh, uh, look um, each of the agreements and, and try to uh, pull out paragraphs of these agreements into each of these categories. So this was a crowdsourced uh, exercise. And obviously there is the caveat of uh, subjectivity uh, or, uh, uh, as part of the evaluator. So um, we try to promote um, uh, a shared understanding of what goes into each of these categories, but um, there, there is an element of uh, subjectivity here. Um, so obviously the, the findings are not intended to be uh, authoritative, uh, but they are uh, trying to expand the, the, the conversation uh, and, and, and try to um, improve our understanding of these. Uh, this is uh, John's magic uh, heat map table, and, and uh, basically the work of, of the volunteers went into categorizing uh, paragraphs of each of those agreements into these 26 categories. So this is the heat map. Um, of course, you cannot read all of the elements here. I'm just going to highlight a couple of things. Um, the, the most... Uh, um, mention or the uh, most paragraphs uh, of most of the agreements uh, had these two elements. One, uh, rights and freedoms, human rights in particular, which is uh, quite an interesting finding. And a non-surprising finding that um, um, most of these agreements deal with general cooperation. 
Um, so, uh, John ran um, frequency tables with these percentages, and we can see basically two things that are relevant. Uh, again, the, the general cooperation on uh, 80, 86% uh, of, the, of the agreements uh, have uh, norms on general cooperation. And uh, interesting, 69% of them on, on human rights. Um, this uh, prioritization or this frequency was consistent with the findings of the 2020 Best Practice Forum uh, report. And uh, while general cooperation uh, can be unsurprising, because obviously international norms tend to uh, be about uh, cooperation, but it's uh, an interesting finding is um, the, the human rights element there. Uh, another part to, to mention here in this table is obviously um, the less uh, frequency. Uh, uh, what were the things that were less frequent? And, and this had to do uh, mostly with um, um, uh, restraint on the development of use on, on, on cyber capabilities. For example, uh, botnets uh, were only 8% and election um, infrastructure um, uh, related norms were only 11% of the agreement. But something that is interesting in this general category of restraint uh, is that um, most of them uh, are referring to non-state actors. Um, so, so of those that uh, have restraint uh, into it, only 33% um, uh, uh, re relate to restraint on non-state uh, actors. All right, so uh, this is frequency over time. Uh, it's a, a lot of data to um, visualize, but uh, this uh, graph is a little bit uh, more friendly, and, and, and it is about uh, how these uh, frequencies evolve through time. And we separated the agreements into um, year groups uh, um, from 2008, 2011, 2012, 2015, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see here uh, how um, consistently um, sort of human rights uh, considerations have uh, been uh, growing through time as well as uh, cooperation. So um, another part of this exercise was uh, a little bit of text analysis. And, and we, what we did was to uh, put in, in, in a mixer only the operational clauses of, of these 36 agreements. So basically, we cut all the introductory um, paragraphs. We cut all the uh, whereas and the background information. And we only left the recommendations per se. So these operational clauses, we aggregate them all together from all these 36 uh, agreements and we put it in um, sort of uh, machine uh, text analysis uh, and, and, and we produce interesting things. Um, so, so here is the, the, the simple uh, uh, word cloud of those operational clauses and, and you could see the most frequent words um, are data, information, security, cybersecurity and cyber. Um, next are shawl or state, uh, access and computer. These are all reflected by, by the size of, of the words here. Um, so uh, this is a, a computer generated linkage of, of those most frequent uh, words and um, there is a, a report that uh, we had with um, sort of how each of, of these words uh, relate to each other, which is uh, quite interesting. And there is much more uh, analysis that we could do, but uh, we couldn't finish on time. Um, these are a couple of tables that uh, I find relevant. Um, so these are uh, terms shall not. Um, so uh, on the negative side, uh, this is the right side of shall not. Uh, so carry out such ac actions, uh, shall not mandate the party, shall not warrant transmitting, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And there are on the more positive side, sort of uh, these um, uh, sentences or shall be used, uh, shall be an integral part, shall cooperate, shall cooperate, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so this is uh, the uh, 
quantitative analysis, but uh, obviously these uh, descriptive elements uh, need to be um, considered together with uh, more qualitative analysis that um, uh, Anakin uh, has uh, kindly contributed to uh, the work stream one, and I will uh, leave her to talk about her findings in each of these. Uh, thanks, Pablo. Uh, just mindful of the time and, uh, and and also the fact that I will be uh, part of the panel discussion lately, re re later, I I just wanted to say two sentences about the, <clears throat> the uh, qu qualitative analysis. First, this quantitative, these numbers don't tell us necessarily about the quality of those norms. And one uh, like thing we need to keep in mind is that those that are more frequently cited or, or repeated actually tend to be the most general ones. And the idea is that without keeping that in mind, we don't necessarily understand that consensus about the topic does not necessarily lead consensus or unity in how they're implemented. But I, I would cut my, my remarks uh, very short at this point. Uh, thanks, Pablo, for giving the overview. And I'm sure we get to discuss the, the content uh, down the road. Thank you very much, Pablo and Anakin. And then next, we will go over to Mallory Nodal, who is actually uh, live at the event, uh, to share the work that she and her team did on testing norms concepts against cybersecurity events. Mallory, over to you. Hi. Thanks, Martin. Thank you. I think it might be on. I just need to be closer. Hi, everybody. Um, wish you were all here with us here in Katowice, but nice to see you online. Um, so I'm going to talk about the second work stream, which um, the report is titled Testing Norms Concept, Concepts Against Cybersecurity Events. Um, as Martin said, our main research question was how would specific norms have been effective at mitigating adverse cybersecurity events? And from there, um, we planned um, research with a group of of folks similar to the way we approached um, our research last year. And we had some returning researchers, volunteer researchers in our group, and I want to thank them. Um, Anastasia Kazakova um, from Kaspersky, Neve Healy, Allison Wild, Barbara Marchiori de Assis, Fred Hansen, Evan Summers, Louise Marie Harrell, Ying Chu Chin, and Apertine Vinyarthi. Um, also, Wim de Gazelle helped a lot. It would have been really difficult to do all of this work um, in the last year um, without their help, so I just want to acknowledge them. We um, had an ambitious plan to look at some of the most significant cybersecurity events of the last couple decades, um, not only to do a sort of general amount of desk research to understand them better, but then we also tasked ourselves with doing more qualitative analysis. We um, sought to interview um, and understand better the impacts of the folks who are most affected by these cybersecurity events and then those who mitigated them as well. Um, so that, as you can imagine, is time intensive, but also incredibly rewarding and allows us to um, really lift up the voices of those most affected into a platform like the Internet Governance Forum, and hopefully we have their ongoing involvement as these uh, reports and findings make their way into um, treaty-level discussions um, where we can start building a story bank of how cybersecurity um, will really impact um, people and a people-centered approach to cybersecurity. So it's an important exercise. Um, before I get into some of what we found and um, what we, because we'll also talk with some of them um, during the panel as well, um, I just wanted to talk about our methods and how um, we approach this problem. So we first had to determine out of the vast choice of, of cybersecurity incidents that had a significant impact, which we were actually going to study. Um, and so as you can imagine, even just that very first step was, was a bit difficult. We wanted to make sure um, that out of all of them, we had some spread, that we were able to glean a large scope um, of, of um, results and findings. So we made sure that um, 
the representative cybersecurity incidents we chose um, were spread across geography, of course, um, to make sure that they um, that, that we were looking at things that affected all parts of the world. Um, that they um, either were successfully um, mitigated, that some of them were actually attributed. We wanted to make sure that the outcome was compelling as well, that they had proper scale. They really did um, affect lots of people and, 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 or, or change the conversation as well. That's another version of scale of impact, that um, things changed as a result, right? Um, and that there was just proper um, knowledge and documentation and acknowledgement of it in the larger collective imagination. Essentially, press reported on it. There was some public record of what happened. Um, and let's see what else. We also wanted different types. So as you can imagine, a cybersecurity event, as Martin said, doesn't just mean that you know there was a breach or something like that. We actually wanted to take a broader view. Um, and so we included um, types such as malware, DDoS attacks, um, you know, persistent threats, um, actually te technique disclosure. So. <clears throat> That is sometimes a version of a threat, or sorry, a breach. Uh, vulnerabilities, um, supply chain issues. So um, let's see, I wanna make sure I've covered everything. We ended up with nine then. So from taking a, a sort of global spread across different kinds of incidents, um, we ended up with nine events that we wanted to learn more about just based on what was available online and various reports that have been published in the past. So most of our time, I think, was spent in this phase, um, really looking through the literature, trying to um, answer the questions, the larger question, which turned into a few sub-questions. So the larger question, would cyber norms have affected the outcomes? We first had to answer um, what norms would, uh, what existing norms would, um, would apply? Um, which norms did apply, depending on when the incident happened? Um, which norms could have been helpful um, to try to expand that more? Um, let's see. I'm going to just scan through a few here. I could also list them out. You can read the report as well. But one um, that we looked at, we did this sort of in linear time, um, was the CIH virus, 1999, um, that targeted Windows machines specifically. It certainly precipitated a whole lot of response from Microsoft at the time, which has been fantastic, as you'll note. Microsoft is still involved in this work today um, and is really driving a lot of it, which is excellent. Um, we, lo we also looked at the Estonian DDoS attacks in 2007. That seemed like a really significant event just after the country had um, digitized almost every aspect of governance. It, um, the DDoS attack effectively took a lot of that offline. A really interesting one, um, as folks already on this stage today have talked about NSO Group. Um, and targeted attacks. We had one um, that we looked at back in 2009 was GhostNet. GhostNet was targeted at um, Tibetan activists, if you remember, uncovered by the Citizen Lab and was one of the very first examples that was widely reported of these targeted attacks against um, civil society journalists and so on. Um, that is one where we went beyond desk research and did more qualitative um, interviews, and hopefully we have somebody from Tibet Action who will be joining us in a little while on the panel to talk about how um, they were affected. Um, we looked at Stuxnet. A lot of you will recognize that name. Certainly in a case where um, infrastructure um, was targeted. Uh, we looked, all, because of the um, impact on the conversation, maybe the most significant one on our list from that was the Snowden disclosures. We, we imagined, we surmised that a lot of the norms packages that um, Workstream One was going to investigate actually were inspired by or had a lot um, to say about what Snowden leaked in 2013. And while we didn't see a lot of like obvious evidence of that for a variety of reasons, it wouldn't necessarily be documented, we did um, feel that was an important one to include. Uh, Anastasia um, looked at Heartbleed, which happened in 2014. This affected websites all over the world using transport layer security. 
massive, massive uh, vulnerability. Um, similar to the Estonian DDoS attacks in 2007, came in 2018 when the Adhar data breach in India occurred. Um, there are not a whole lot of similarities other than it's a government level infrastructure for um, delivering um, government level services through a unique ID. And then lastly, um, no, sorry, not lastly. Um, recently, in 2020, we covered the solar winds attack because that was an interesting one from a supply chain hardware perspective. Um, and that also had qualitative review. So thanks to Allison Wild and um, her team for that. And then lastly, we um, include, again, yeah, NSO Group's Pegasus. That is an ongoing um, persistent threat that um, is software actually being sold to nation state and nation state actors um, to target individuals and um, is still making headlines pretty much every day. So it's really good that we were able to um, also sort of more deeply investigate that um, through a qualitative review. So. Um, I don't think I have a whole lot of time left, um, but I just wanted to say that we um, gleaned a variety of findings. I'm actually gonna encourage you to read the report to get the findings. I didn't want to present them because we want feedback on our process. I think that for me, there was so much that I got curious about throughout this research that I would like to have continued it. I think we should actually continue it. Um, this is um, a, a draft report. We could take comments. We could continue to, to do this research on additional events. We can do more qualitative work. What I would really like to see um, for the purposes of continued advocacy and engagement in other norm setting and standardizing processes is actually to gather real stories, almost like a story bank, where we could keep um, these for um, for future um, discussion and presentation when, when they matter, when we need to make the case that you know, there are real people at the end um, of, these, um, of these attacks. And so I'm hoping that that can be a direction we go in. And of course, this best practice forum is an open multi-stakeholder process at the IGF, and anyone can join us if you find this work compelling, if you'd like to give us feedback on prior work that we've done or join us to do future work, I'd really um, welcome you to do that. So with that, I'll end and hand it back over to you, Martin, because I think we'll get into some more of the interesting discussion about what we actually found um, in the panel and what it all means. Thanks. Thank you very much, Valerie, for that introduction to the work that you did. Um, it was great work from a very large team, and uh, we're very thankful for everyone who contributed. Um, maybe to reiterate one thing that Mallory said at the beginning of her session, which I think is uh, probably the most important takeaway from all the work that we're doing here. Um, cybersecurity events and incidents are all about impact. It is almost always completely impossible to um, prevent the incident outright or the event. It is very, very hard to um, effectively prevent all possible impact, but as a community, it is definitely plausible to reduce impact and make things lighter on the individuals, the organizations, the social structures that are unburdened by those events. Um, and so the idea of actually introducing what the impact is on individuals, how they are affected, and how norms can help them is, uh, for many of the participants in this group, um, a core objective of actually having better norms conversations. So I'm very grateful for the work that the team did with live interviews and really um, encourage everyone to read through the document. Now, next up, we will go into a panel session, and the goal of that panel session is to really think about how can the work that was done that is available in these two documents that we've shared um, here with you today, how can it become more effective? And what is actually the value and what are the drawbacks of actually relying on some of these cyber normative structures? And for that, we have a great group of panelists. And in order to introduce them, I'll actually hand it over to our three moderators. And uh, they are the three work stream leads who put so much effort this year in the work that we're presenting here. Mallory Nodal uh, from the Center for Democracy and Technology, Pablo Hinojosa with APNIC, and Shetal Kumar with Global Partners Digital. So I'll hand it over to the three of them to introduce their panelists and get started with what I expect will be 30, 40 minutes of a really, really great and productive conversation.
Well, this will be tricky when you handle a task to three people in three separate parts. I think I would prefer Mallory to lead this, uh, but um, um, I think the importance of this panel is to um, sort of analyze the value of these reports uh, from um, the experts and, and contribute as well on, on future uh, work uh, of the of, of the BPF and um, the role of the IGF in continuing discussing the cyber norms. I will um, uh, leave my moderating task uh, here. <laughs> Sure, I can, I can do my best, um, although you are all there and I am all just by myself over here, but that's fine. It's really nice to see all your faces. Um, I'm going to give you the opportunity to introduce yourself um, as you, when you make your first comment rather than, rather than me doing that for you, also because I've lost the list that was in front of me. Um, so, so please, um, each of you take a bit of time Remembering that we have about four questions to get through, um, there are six of you. Um, the first question is, what trends do you see in cyber norms development across agreements and over time? Um, and where do you think these trends lead concretely? And if you're not necessarily speaking from the perspective of somebody engaged in norms, um, also talk about that and your perception of where norms are going um, and how they affect you. Thanks. Um, why don't you, in Zoom, I imagine you have some listing and you can just go from, from top to bottom. I am unfortunately unable to see that. Maybe I'm looking at when, Grace, maybe you can help me. Yeah. you are the first. Thanks. Okay, I, I, I can see that listing, but I'm happy to go first. Uh, and I take it you want us just to address that question and we'll go through each of the four questions? Introduce yourself and yeah, let's um, go ahead and, and address that question first and you can do it briefly if you have plans to address another question more at length. Great, uh, I'm Chris Painter. I'm the president of the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise Foundation. Uh, the GFCE is a worldwide capacity building group uh, community of about 150 multi-stakeholder members, including many states, private sector, civil society. And, and I think this ties in the, the, you know, I'll speak both from the perspective of the GFC, but also my personal experience for dealing with these areas for 30 years. Uh, and my last government job as our top cyber diplomat in the US and, and involved in norms very much. Look, I think, first of all, I wanna commend uh, the work of this, this group. I think it's very valuable looking at uh, how, uh, you know, what the trends are, what we've seen, how these have actually been used. Uh, and I, I think that, you know, as I think about the trends, certainly we've seen a greater attention to these issues over the years as we've seen, you know, more and more destructive cyber attacks, cyber intrusions. And, uh, and just recently, as everyone knows, in the UN, there was quite a bit of attention with both the GFC, uh, both the uh, Group of Governmental Experts Report and the Open Ended Working Group Report, which I think are very valuable. So I think I like the rubber meets the road sort of uh, framing for this. And indeed, what we try to do with the GFC is not negotiate new norms, but take the ones that have been done and put them into practice. And there was a lot of good language, I think, in the GGE report in particular about how capacity building is an important underlying part of implementing these norms. So, so if you're trying to implement this, these norms, I think the work you've done it's really helpful to do that. From my non-GFC hat, I just note that one of the things when you talk about norms and their impact, norms have an impact in terms of just being norms themselves that are out there. But there's an also an issue of accountability and whether there's accountability for violations of norms. And if there's not, I think one of the questions is, and I think this is subsumed in your research, what effect the norms will have if there is no accountability, if there's no uh, it, you know, consequences, if there's no, uh, you know, calling out of norms violations, do those norms continue to have any, any force? And I think one that would bear even, you know, more study now is the, the norms from the, the uh, UN, the G Group of Governmental Experts on due diligence, on uh, countries controlling malicious conduct coming from their borders. And in light of ransomware, which is, of course, what's uh, the hot topic now, how that plays in, what you've seen, how you've seen that norm used, and indeed, I think we've seen that used over time. So again, 
I have something to say on the other questions, but I really commend this work. And I think an important pillar of this work and something I want to pursue is how we can translate this work into some of the capacity building work around the world to get more countries, more actors involved in this discussion and also involved in involved in actually implementing the norms to give them more real value and meaning going forward. Great, thank you, Chris. Um, Art? Welcome. We can go with Sharif as, as well. Uh, hi, it's a real pleasure being uh, in this uh, very, really lively panel. Um, I would like to highlight a few things first. Uh, let me introduce myself. I am a professor at Louis Mason University. I'm a board member of FIRST. Um, in my quite a big job, echo, work... Sharif. It's okay. Excuse me? Very big echo uh, sound. Yeah, I, I'll try to use a headset. Maybe that would uh, you know, uh, make things a bit easier. So. Uh, Okay, maybe that's better now? Okay, excellent. Um, so, um, uh, I've, I've been a member of the UNGGE uh, in 2012-2013. Uh, I've been part of the process of the UNGGE as well as the open-ended working group over the past nine years. Um, in my home country, Egypt, I'm currently in the U.S., but in my home country, Egypt, I've led uh, various national initiatives. I've been also internationally engaged with the ITU and different international fora when it comes to, uh, you know, cybersecurity, developing norms, implementing them. Uh, with regard to the work done uh, within uh, the best practice, you know, uh, dimension, it is very important to uh, look at norms and look at the, the requirement of you know building trust and confidence ahead of a cyber incident and confidence building measures are really integral part of the process and you can see in the UNGGE reports it's also complementary uh, of what the norms are about uh, multi-stakeholderism is really important involving key stakeholders government non-government industry academia uh, civil society is key. But if uh, we talk about the, the challenges, and here also I'd like to highlight, it's very important to look at best practices when it comes to applying norms. Uh, applying norms is not just a compliance list that we have done this or that and things are fine. It is a process that involves everyone all the time in different aspects of life. Uh, to give you an example, you mentioned, for instance, botnet activities and DDoS attacks. Uh, in my home country, we had the challenge uh, at the beginning of, you know, any instant, major instant, you get uh, a report from, uh, you know, a foreign country that there is a botnet activity involving Egyptian infrastructure. When it comes to, again, the norms that address what countries should do, the first step is to take steps to, uh, you know, mitigate that risk and, you know, eliminate it, hopefully, with, which involves, you know, uh, uh, applying this in, you know, in the framework of the country, meaning the dealing with the infrastructure operators, private sectors. So you go to the private sector and now you, you have to, uh, you know, deal with the dynamics, security versus privacy. Uh, we had uh, very interesting feedback uh, and challenging feedback, I would say, at the beginning. Uh, some of the private sector said, this is, again, is the privacy of our clients. You're talking about met botnets coming from certain IPs. Those IPs, I mean, are actually uh, allocated to, uh, you know, could be banks, could be uh, education institutions or others. And now the, the ISP is hesitant to communicate with the customers for fear that this is, uh, you know, uh, going to be seen as if they are, you know, spying on uh, c customers, you know, traffic. Uh, it requires a lot more than just saying that we have this, you know, multi-stakeholder approach uh, and, and that is enough to deal with instance. So I'm, I really uh, um, uh, would like to highlight it's important to, uh, you know, study instance and, and how they play out, but also the dynamics uh, that needs to be implemented within a country 
to be able to uh, add higher. I mean, when, when you say, you know, a country is responsible for this or should do this or shouldn't do this, we should try to have best practices on really how to deploy this. Uh, also, we had a challenge dealing with, you know, reporting and exchanging information at the beginning. I'm talking about the process that started over 12 years ago. Uh, initially, there are certain law enforcement, uh, you know, uh, agencies, and when it comes to diplomacy, uh, uh, treaties and agreements, uh, and, and sometimes when you have an incident and you're talking about the technical community, instant responders who, who are involved with dealing with, you know, botnet activities or other cyber incidents, you, you have to realize that there are other partners that somehow you need to coordinate with. So dealing with escalation and building confidence and trust within your circle of, you know, uh, collaborators within the country is important. Also, it's important to have uh, this multiplied at the regional level. I'm currently a member of the uh, cybersecurity expert group at the African Union, and we share the same, uh, you know, type of challenges. And it would be nice to recognize best practices now to deal with them. I'd like to end my intervention here, and maybe we'll have another opportunities to have comments uh, in the, I mean, the coming questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sharif. And um, coming in as one of the, the moderators, and just to ask Art, and perhaps um, come back to you as well if you have something to say on this, but one of the uh, findings in the analysis was that, and I think there was a session about this topic as well at the IGF earlier in the week, was about the importance having assessed the, the heart bleed and the ghost um, net uh, incidents about promoting the neutrality of, of the technical community incident response responders and vulnerability analysts and the importance of that in ensuring effective and timely responses and just wondering what you think about that finding and, and also just um, perhaps more generally about this methodology of research that was used of engaging frontline defenders and incident responders in better understanding incidents and relevant norms. So I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about that. Either Art or Sharif. We can see you now. I'm not sure if we can hear you. Yep. Uh, uh, is the audio OK? Yep. Yes. Great. Thanks. Um, sorry I was didn't have the speaking powers a moment ago. Um, so thanks very much for the opportunity. Um, very briefly, I'm Art Mannion. Um, my day job is at the CERT Coordination Center. We are effectively a C-CERT or a CERT team. Uh, I work very much with cybersecurity vulnerabilities. So these are often um, security bugs or defects in products or services. And the reporting of the vulnerabilities and the disclosure of them are, are the things I work with the most. Um, we're also a member of FIRST. Uh, we're very, very uh, heavily involved in the FIRST uh, form of incident response and security teams. Uh, again, with this sort of vulnerability, cybersecurity vulnerability angle. Um, in terms of the norms, this, I think, falls pretty heavily in there's uh, the reliability of products, so reporting vulnerabilities, supply chain, uh, and some of the response, response norms. Anyway, that's where my expertise is, so you know, my comments are based on, on those areas. Certainly, uh, those are not the only uh, areas you're, you're, you're covering here. Um, I think in terms of the methodology, as you asked, uh, I personally am a big uh, fan or a proponent of the uh, of the testing, the the, um, the 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 cybersecurity events and the cases and the testing. You know, compared to the norms, I think that's a very practical approach. Um, right, you've got a list of events to look at, uh, a list of the norms, and you know, do they align? Do they not align? Um, since those events are things that have actually happened, you know, again, very practical approach. So I, I do like that approach. Um, one comment would be. Uh, if this work continues, you know, I think the methodology is reasonably sound, but um, keep, keep an eye on what's changing, what's new. Uh, are there new norms? There will always be new events. You know, some will have, some will be the same old event uh, 10 years later with, with new, new players and new things. Um, but I think there are new, there are actually changes over time and new events. So keep up a bit with, um, with whatever's happening. Um, the norms, so the vulnerability response and supply chain norms, uh, I think are on a upward trend. They are more common. Uh, when I speak to people these days, they already know what vulnerability disclosure or reporting uh, are, which is great. So I think, there's, I think there is growth uh, and 
normalization of the norms, which is a very, a very good thing. Um, I'm not sure there's enough yet. Um, we have stories of organizations being uh, attacked and exploited and compromised with known vulnerabilities. So a vulnerability for which there is a patch or an update from the vendor, uh, a public disclosure has already happened, and yet the vulnerability management or patching race uh, does not seem to be always won by, by defenders. Uh, I'm honestly not sure what to do there. I've spent 20 years advising people to patch uh, internet facing bad vulnerabilities as quickly as possible. It still seems to be a hard problem to, to solve at scale. Um, and this is already touched on, but I do wanna sort of call attention to, um, perhaps it's not a written down norm, but in, in the land of cybersecurity vulnerabilities, um, there is very much uh, a market for the offensive use of vulnerabilities. Um, even the events, some of the events listed here, uh, right, the NSO Pegasus software, Stuxnet, SolarWinds, all involve at different points in time, effectively zero day vulnerabilities, where the offensive actor uh, knew about the vulnerability, the vendor or provider did not, the users and the rest of the world did not, um, and despite our efforts to, to close these vulnerabilities, get them patched and fixed, uh, and get them mitigated, um, again, there is an active, active, there are active markets for uh, finding vulnerabilities, uh, selling them uh, privately, um, and then exploiting them. So um, I try to keep in mind that that is happening, and that is one of the, one of the factors our norms are trying to work against. Um, and I will stop there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Art. Really, really useful and helpful points. Um, and would also love to hear from, from others if you have any reactions to, to what Art was saying there, including on that whole issue of the, of the market for vulnerabilities and that wider ecosystem challenge. Uh, so if we could go to um, perhaps Lobsang now, I hope you're on the line with us um, because it, it's in, in the research um, and the findings, um, it's very clear that the, the direct impact of the, of the incidents on people and on humanitarian groups um, can be very stark. And, and I understand you were involved in, in some of that, uh, in, in, those, in that, those findings and, and directly impacted, of course, um, through your work at Tibet Action Institute. So I was wondering if you'd like to reflect on some of these findings, perhaps also on the methodology um, and perhaps Mallory's idea as well for, for a story bank um, for how this impacts others. And absolutely, we'll not forget Enikin, um, Pablo, but um, perhaps Lobsang, or we can go directly to Enikin for your reflections as well if Lobsang's not here with us at the moment. Um, uh, either way is fine. So I can go next or I can go after Enikin. Okay, so um, shall we go with you first for a couple of minutes and then we'll go directly to Enikin. Thanks so much. So, uh, hi everyone, uh, I'm Lofsang and I work with Tibet Action Institute as the Director of Technology. And in some ways, I think in terms of the norms, right, uh, it's the organization that I work for, we actually work uh, on reducing the impact, as well as kind of looking at capacity building within the community in terms of reducing the impact, right? So when the whole question of like, or the discussion was going towards cyber norms, right, I think one thing that I just wanted to say was, during the time of the 2008 or 2009 Coastnet report, right, one of the major issues was attribution. And in some ways, I think there is some, whether it's a norm that's already written down, but there's been some norm that's already been set towards attribution, right? So in terms of whether, like, if you look at the US, the solar winds or others, or like even like the disinformation campaigns, which is not directly related to the cybersecurity incidents, but there is some norms that are being set and I'm not sure whether those norms are recognized at the UN level, but they are being set. So I think there's a question about how some of these norms are being set and how some of these norms are being used by different states. At the same time, I want, really wanted to echo what Christopher said earlier about accountability, right? Uh, you can attribute as much as you want, but if there's no acknowledgement or no accountability, then it kind of uh, comes back to the he said, she said kind of whole concept, right? And that kind of like, I think has an issue in terms of like 
development of norms. So I think that's something that uh, I just wanted to say in terms of like norm development uh, that I see. And, and for us, I think uh, if you look at like the 2009 attacks, uh, one thing that we always really wanted to know was like, how can we attribute it to a state? Because in some ways we know uh, a lot of the information that was used during the attack, uh, a lot of the confidential information that was stolen during the attacks were used by the Chinese government at that point. However, I think the question was, how do you attribute uh, at a level that is accepted? So I think that was a question that uh, we didn't really have an answer. Maybe that's something that's being developed right now. Uh, another thing, uh, I mean, like, I can speak more <laughs> for the other questions, but one thing that I really wanted to, uh, during the interview, I think one of the things that kind of made, uh, uh, made me ask a bit of the question about the norms was the question about uh, infrastructure, right? What is critical infrastructure? And I think that's a question that like, uh, I tend to think about a bit more because like, uh, if you look at a government, right, and I think most of us understand what critical infrastructure is. And if you look at a CERT, uh, a, a government CERT, they understand what a critical infrastructure is. But then if you look at the civil society space, uh, critical infrastructure for us may be our website. So if you look at our organization, tibetaction.net, that's a critical infrastructure for us because it allows us to do the work that we do. And if that is taken down, that is actually harming the work that we do and it has some real impact on the ground. So I think the question is, how do you define critical infrastructure? And I think uh, uh, if you want the cyber norms to be a multi-stakeholder norm, I think critical infrastructure does need to be redefined. Thanks. Thanks so much, Lobsang. And uh, it's great to hear both from you and from Art, and I think just more generally that it sounds like while we are obviously seeing a lot of challenges and increasing incidents, we're also seeing some progress and progress in understanding um, uh, what uh, we can do. And one of the actual, um, I think, takeaways or, or key findings from the research overall was that norms are helpful and uh, that the norms we have today would have been helpful in mitigating some of these incidents from the past. So there's a lot to do still, as, and you point there too, where it would be helpful to think through uh, how critical infrastructure is defined, including uh, from a humanitarian or human-centric point of view. So that's, that's really key, so obviously a lot more work to do, but it, it does sound like progress is being made, which is always great to hear. So. Just turning over to Anakin now for your reflections on, on the findings of the report based on your um, very long-standing expertise here on the issues or on norms, Anakin, uh, over to you. Thanks, Shetal. Um, and I, I, I guess in my mind, I, I still uh, sort of, uh, wrap my, my answer to around Mallory's first question, which is the trends and, uh, and maybe where, where we're headed in my mind. Um, I am an academic. I uh, am part of a small institute, cyber policy institute, that uh, looks uh, into this inter interstate uh, conversations about, uh, uh, well, both the development and, and then now implementation of norms. <clears throat> and the why I stay stay inter interstate, I, I would say that the conversation has still been like increasingly between governments. And I think in this panel, we we already have identified uh, some of these uh, the parallel trends that are yet to merge uh, with this UN and, uh, and the sort of intergovernmental conversations about how to best implement uh, the, the norms. So, so some of the trends that I think we should be mindful about, uh, I think it's too early to celebrate cyber norms. And one of the reasons is that um, I guess we are a little bit operating in a bubble, meaning that while in our cyber bubble, uh, so cyber norms like politically may make perfect sense, we have to be mindful that first of all, we feel the need to uh, enforce something that we, uh, we, but we label a voluntary and non-binding and, and mainly or largely that enforcement comes from the like-minded governments. And I think in this forum, we need to think about A, how to, uh, either broaden that community that, uh, well, whatever form of enforcement, uh, guidance, uh, persuasion goes into implementing the norms would be, uh, would be much more uh, either like uh, just, uh, just, just diverse. And uh, the other thing that I think is notable about cyber norms that most of them are not restraint norms. 
So that is something that, that when you looked at the UNGGE uh, recommendations and then what has been suggested by the industry and by other stakeholders, uh, in these other stakeholder propositions, there is much more expectation toward uh, uh, restraint than uh, what the GGE has been able to agree. And acknowledging that the GGE, or for that, my, uh, for that matter, the, also the open-ended working group, uh, well, only has so much time and so much like effort to, to put into this detailed implementation. We have to be aware of these implications of, of first, the norms being uh, rather abstract and what that allows in terms of different implementations and the divergences that exist between stakeholders on how to exactly implement them. And for example, supply chain is a, is a good example where, uh, where governments and uh, and the industry that both prioritize the issue don't necessarily come to the same picture or same idea how exactly or who exactly is the, the key, uh, key um, uh, well, has the key, key responsibility for implementation. So, uh, just touching upon one of the questions that came up uh, also in the chat about the informal pe peer pressure, I think uh, like these trends uh, should make us think about like or actually uh, pay attention to where we find this peer pressure, pressure that comes from also other epistemic communities, first responders or civil society or or, or specializing a group specializing on on uh, let's say cybersecurity and governments because where that synergy emerges, we really see that cyber norms or that particular those particular norms are to be celebrated. Whereas it, with all the others, uh, we actually need to think of how to take them further. And uh, I hope I will have uh, another like. Uh, uh, mo moment to, to, to think about further because I, I started my remarks with this cyber bubble. I think one uh, option for the for the BPF to, to take this research further is now to compare these cyber norms about, and our findings about them with what came pre-cyber. Oh, everything we did for information society and why not those bindings, uh, binding rules that we have stayed away from and see how much synergy we can find if we broaden our scope of, uh, of cyber norm implementation. Thank you. Thanks, Anakin. Some really great points and, and a lot to think about there. And thanks for the uh, pointer as well to what we could be looking at um, or focusing on in the future as well. So I uh, would like to come now to Sienna, who I hope is on the line. It's um, great to see so many of us, so <laughs> it's easy to get lost, but I think you are here with us, which is wonderful. Um, as you, um, those of you who have seen the report, you'll know that one of the incidents that's looked at is um, the Pegasus revelations. And that's where perhaps uh, there's quite uh, a lack of enforcement of norms, particularly those relating to human rights and some recommendations in there drawing on that, uh, especially those that have been made elsewhere um, in uh, and by human rights experts on how to address that. So I'd like to turn over to you, um, Sienna, here in case you want to react to some of those findings and, and recommendations that in that report and also uh, if you have any other uh, reflections, including on the research methodology or proposals that others have made um, so far. Ah, so you can't seem to unmute yourself. Okay. Let's see if we can help with that. Are you unmuted now? Oh, just. Hey, everybody. Sorry about that. <laughs> I thought from the beginning this might be an issue, but um, I was hoping that it would be resolved before. Um, so thanks for the invitation to be here, and it's great to be here, and the work so far that's been done and presented is really interesting. Um, I guess I'll just say a few brief words, and then maybe there'll be time for more discussion after. Um, but in short, I'm, I'm Senior Legal Advisor at the Citizen Lab, and for those of you who have never heard of us, just probably nobody in this room. Um, we're an interdisciplinary research lab at the University of Toronto's Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy in Canada. And I personally work primarily on the targeted surveillance of human rights defenders. Um, so my comments will be sort of informed from that work. And as you may know, and as you sort of gave a preface to, the Citizen Lab has been working on uncovering and describing spyware campaigns against human rights defenders and civil society for a long time now. And since 2016, in particular, we've been looking at 
um, and tracking the deployment of NSO groups, Pegasus spyware against these communities, along with other groups such as Amnesty International. Um, and of course, NSO Group is just one among many other companies that we study in the cyber surveillance industry, um, which, as, as I'm sure everybody um, follows here, seems to be growing um, year by year. So I think through this work, one particular thing that arises, um, for lack of a better word, um, from this research is just sort of an absence of norms. And that's what I wanted to underscore in my brief remarks here. And particularly norms that are then translated into an actionable legal framework at the global or domestic level that is sufficient to actually constrain the activities of the surveillance industry and its impacts on human rights defenders. And I think, um, and I think here what's particularly important, I mean, norms set a framework, but norms need to be translated into something that can then be relied on, for example, by human rights defenders um, to seek a measure of accountability or to actually constrain the activities of this industry. Um, and I could talk a bit more about the substance of, of norms and sort of consequent legal principles that would be nice to see, um, but I think a number of the other speakers mentioned um, very pertinent issues, um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Maybe we'll come back to it later. Um, one thing I did want to underline right now is that I think we may be at a particularly critical juncture for the development of norms and rules around the regulation of the cyber surveillance industry and the use of these technologies, and that this momentum is something that really needs to be taken advantage of. And, um, and I think, uh, as many people have, have seen here, there's been a lot of, um, let's say, movement or momentum in the past few weeks. We saw the U.S. take regulatory action against NSO Group and Candiro, two surveillance companies based in Israel. Um, the Biden administration recently announced a new multilateral effort to address the export of surveillance technologies. We also have um, new regulation in the EU, which is specifically starting to integrate a human rights perspective into um, how we manage the export of dual-use technologies, which is a positive um, and promising step, which hopefully will be followed um, more broadly. And further, private companies um, who have significantly more resources at their disposal than human rights defenders, which is why I wanted to mention this, um, Facebook, I guess now Meta and Apple have sued NSO Group, among a bunch of other litigation related to Pegasus by victims. Um, and once again, why I said at the beginning, NSO Group is just one company in, the, in this growing global marketplace for cyber surveillance technologies. I think Litigation is helpful in the sense that it's going to identify what legal deficits really exist in domestic law for holding such companies to account. And that's something that we should be paying attention to and how we understand um, sort of what norms are missing and, and where norms need to go. Um, yeah, and I, I guess, uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. And then if there's um, yeah, more time, I can discuss it more concretely. Thank you. That's great. Thanks so much, um, Sienna. That was really helpful. And I was hoping we could perhaps turn to, well, anyone who wants to respond to any of those points, but um, Mallory, um, I know that you're all alone there in the room. Perhaps you're not all alone now, but hopefully right. some people have joined you. Uh, <laughs> do, you um, do you want to react to any of those points and some of those recommendations about what we might want to look at in the future and leveraging momentum, for example, around this such a critical juncture on, on the regulation of spyware, this issue of that are we, are we operating in a bubble still? Do we need to broaden out the discussion? Um, and the whole concern around that, um, the market in, in, in zero days and, and the vulnerabilities um, that, are, that are still very much um, challenging to, uh, to address because of that. I don't know whether you want to respond to any of those points or ask any further questions to any of the um, analysts. Yeah, thanks for that opportunity. I had been taking notes on some of these high points, and I can go over them now, and, and then we can move into the last couple of questions we have for the panel. So one thing that I picked up on um, that a couple of folks were saying around attribution, um, I think that for, and I'll speak from the perspective of civil society and my um, career and working with um, and witnessing a lot of the ways um, journalists human rights defenders, activists have to think about this, is often the attribution has felt like the accountability. If you can just somehow um, lift the veil on or uncover the fact that someone is targeting you um, as a human rights defender has felt in the past like the first step to accountability because so many groups don't always achieve that. But also then taking Lobsang's approach specifically based on experience that there actually then should be more steps. Um, if attribution is achieved, then there's got to be somebody who, or some mechanism to hold um, that group accountable. So I think that's an important um, and connection to make. Another one around 
just generally what Art mentioned, that the, maybe the scale and impact um, are not always the same. I, I'm reflecting also on the way that we approached the work stream to research, to look at events. We were thinking about scale as a way of expressing impact, but if you take into consideration the, the most recent part of this discussion on um, zero days, on targeted attacks, and so on, that massive scale is really not going to give you um, events that are um, potentially very impactful, but maybe didn't um, impact a large number of people. It has a different quality. So we need to take those into consideration. And I think we did do that, but, but how to then, um, in an ongoing way, talk about um, the scale and the real impact. I'm thinking that it, it seems like if we look at you know the zero days being used for the persistent threat um, software, if we look at ransomware, there are a few examples there where I think the, there's, there are industries cropping up around this, um, and that that maybe is the way to express it. So rather than focusing on individual events as an area of research that we did this year, maybe something else where we focus on kind of the, um, the vector of attack, the method, the, you know, t the industry that's cropping up around some of these. That might be also another um, and separate approach that might lead to different sub-questions and so on. I'm already thinking of the research plan. <laughs> um, and then as well, I think there's, the, I'm trying to remember now exactly how this, min, how this was mentioned or how it came up. I just have it in my notes. But the idea of um, sort of baseline assurance, uh, security as infrastructure, just knowing that there are boundaries beyond which um, states, actors, they will not go. Um, and I'm thinking, generally about um, this is kind of the purpose of norms, but we can maybe think of ways in which there will be even um, harder, rather than softer, harder approaches to creating those boundaries if it's um, commitments to you know, not weaken end-to-end -end encryption, or if it's a commitment to not holding on to zero days. Um, other things like that that might actually be um, Again, a commitment to creating this sort of baseline security as infrastructure for all of us. Those are my reflections. I'm sure others have, have their own. Please feel free to bring them up as, as you get another turn to speak. Um, the question that we have for you next, and you can all answer it in turn, um, is how can the folks or the groups, the governments developing global cyber norms include those most affected by cybersecurity incidents. So um, if you are part of a group that's been a victim or a target of an attack, if you've been a first responder in mitigating attacks, um, how, how could we best include those groups? How can we best include you? How can we best include those groups? Um, I'm gonna start again with Chris, because I know you have thoughts on then building capacity necessary um, for those groups to engage meaningfully in, in norms setting processes. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, that, that's one of the challenges is it, it's, it's not just countries. Uh, a lot of countries don't have the capacity or, or background to engage in these discussions. And that's been helped to some extent over the last couple of years. But still, I think it's, it's an issue, and that's why capacity building is important. But it's really bringing other multi-stakeholder members into this uh, into this club. Uh, you know, when when governments are talking about the norms, they're talking about even if they're norms of restraint for governments or norms of cooperation for governments, the other stakeholders have a role in that. They have knowledge of how the ecosystem works that maybe governments don't. They understand second order effects that maybe governments don't. And, and an example I always give is I, you know, a few years ago, I was giving a keynote at the annual first meeting and uh, I was talking about the UN developed norms, including the ones about not attacking uh, certs uh, or C certs. Uh, and the audience had never heard of that norm before. So there was not a connection between these really important efforts in the UN and the community they were meant to protect. So I think you know, one thing we can all collectively do is draw those communities that are either being trying to be protected or have a stake in this issue, and the people who are debating these issues, uh, especially the government people, closer together. Uh, I, I just one other comment I'd like to make because I know that um, Sheila also just said where where would you like to see the work to go uh, forward? 
I think, you know, it's, it's been very valuable now, but I think also reaching out to other communities, making sure that others get the benefit of this research, I think would be very helpful. And although some of the norms that have been developed have been non-binding or voluntary, as Anakin said, there's still political commitments. There still could be, you can still hold folks accountable for violating them. And I think that would be another interesting thing to see from the future of this work is to measure when there have been accountability efforts, uh, have those been effective? When they have not, what has that meant for the development of norms? So, you know, go from what you've done now to also how they're being implemented and whether accountability is there or not and how we might be able to improve that. Great, thanks so much, Chris. Um, Love saying you've, you've um, indicated you'd like to say a few words on this, so we'll go to you. So, sure. uh, thanks, Chito. So yeah, I think uh, one thing that we have done uh, as a community, uh, so we've started our own kind of cert. Technically, it's not a, uh, it's kind of like a civil society cert. And in terms of capacity building, I think that is something that, uh, and we're also part of the global community of uh, civil society certs, which is called the city cert. And so I think there's this aspect of like, I think there's a capacity building, which is important aspect of how do you develop the cyber norms? And if you look at the GGE reports, right, it actually does mention that uh, about capacity building, capacity building, but it is focused on the government level. So I think those other groups or other kind of like initiatives uh, done by civil society, how do you integrate some of that into the more kind of like the traditional governmental roles or governmental kind of structures? I think there's a space there to do that. So I think maybe it's a collaboration of these two different aspects of being able to build off on the traditional structures of the CERT to have the civil society kind of versions of it and being able to collaborate on that at the same time also being able to collaborate on certain aspects with uh, industry or whether it's the government as well. Thanks so much, Love Sang. And I think that's a really great example as well of how um, you can practically broaden engagement and collaboration with other communities and by setting up something like that, an, infra an infrastructure institution like that, a mechanism, and thereby expanding uh, the range of actors that you engage with and collaborate with. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so uh, the DACA Remote Hub uh, would like to come in if you are able to. That would be great. And thanks, Pablo, for, for highlighting that to us. You have the floor. Okay, it might be an issue with audio. So I'm, um, hope I'll come back to you, remote hug Daka. Uh, but shall we go? I don't know whether it was, yes, thank you. There are 10 minutes left. Whether it was Sharif or Sienna, um, but I'll, I'll go to Sharif, you're next on my screen. So over to you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to highlight a couple of points that were raised, uh, the cyber bubble and um, what Chris mentioned also about, you know, uh, the importance of trying to uh, join or bridge different silos, people working from, you know, government, uh, industry, civil society, uh, the general public, uh, critical infrastructure. They don't usually meet or work together unless uh, there is a special effort targeted, you know, to get, bring them together when it comes to applying cyber norms. Um, cyber norms were developed by, you know, governments and it is part of the UN uh, mandate. So it, it's always the case that it talks about state responsibilities, states should do this or that. But when it comes to reality, it has to be, you know, in partnership. And there are some norms that target, you know, or highlight the importance of a multi-stakeholder approach when it comes to implementing norms. And that's the part of, you know, the roles and responsibilities of various stakeholders. Uh, and I've, I've had different positions working for government and working for academia and working with industry. Uh, it's really important to bring them all together. As I said earlier, in, in a cyber instant, you need to have this trust relationship built ahead of time uh, uh, and, and, and to roll out you know the uh, the activities that need to take place to face that instant it's important for the group uh, to recognize also best practices and how to make this work in reality 
and and uh, th this you know uh, is very important link to attribution for instance uh, when it comes to attribution when a cyber incident is ongoing you don't know who's behind it you don't know what type of uh, you know uh, is it a state actor is it non-state actor is this ransomware by by a group or is it you know a part of an apt against the state you only find out about this when you have partners working together and there are several instances i mean really uh, that we can explore more in terms of research uh, you know the colonial pipeline that happened in the us and the uh, eastern part of the us affecting you know uh, uh, i mean uh, uh, i mean the energy sector for several days uh, and and that was a group in russia uh, and, and again, collaboration across different states, across diff within the same state, uh, need to be there in, in ahead of time. So focusing on, I mean, examples like this uh, is is really important. Also, uh, I'd like to highlight that is the, the UN, the new UN open-ended working group that just started. So it's it's very important to uh, mobilize, you know, uh, resources, build capacity within different, uh, you know, stakeholders, not just states, not just governments, but across different disciplines so that we know how to engage, we know where our roles and responsibilities are, um, uh, and that would have an effective uh, impact on really the outcomes. Thanks so much, um, Sure, you have some really great points there. Um, the, a remote hub doc, I will go to you. If you could keep it short as we are coming to the end, that would be much appreciated. And sorry to you waited so long. Am I audible? Hello, thank you so much. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, the question is, we know that the young generations are more vulnerable part of cyberspace work. How can internet governance work for saving them by building data layer on social media or websites, especially how can internet governance work with those companies who provide this type of service? Thank you so much. Thanks so much for that question. And I really invite anyone who wants to respond to do so in the chat. Um, and we can highlight that in the report, the responses. Unfortunately, we are really running out of time. So I don't think we can open up to respond. Um, Martin, I'm gonna take my cue from you as to next steps. Excellent, Chital. If you could wrap us up with uh, some of the conclusions that we had uh, previously been discussing and that we've been taking notes of during the session, I think that would be a great way to, to close the discussion so far. Great, I'll try and do that in a minute. Um, so what I, we heard is that the research is very commendable and useful and, and that the, the methodology of engaging with those affected um, is practical and it's very important to study incidents and how they play out, especially at country level, dealing with um, escalation and trust between collaborators in country. These are all real issues on the ground um, and perhaps gathering best practices uh, in that regard would be helpful. Um, I think we also heard that expanding beyond the, the usual suspects and diversifying Buying, um, operating outside the bubble will be helpful. And Anakin shared a resource um, that has been worked on to try and do that, uh, showcasing examples at the national level. We heard that there is progress happening, um, perhaps uh, on socializing the importance of disclosing vulnerabilities and on attribution. We've seen more progress in that regard, but there's still a long way to go and a lot of concerns as well um, continuing around uh, certain markets, including in, in zero days. And so the recommendations that we keep an eye on what's changing, what's new, what's happening, and where attribution has been achieved, what's worked, um, because we do need a way to hold to account uh, when these incidents happen. Um, so what has worked and, and how could it be improved? Uh, we could analyze that going forward. Um, and we also heard there's still an absence of norms in some spaces, particularly around um, spyware, but there are opportunities and we could be at a critical juncture to um, leverage those opportunities to address some norms and, and translate them to, to more effective legal frameworks. Um, so uh, four key takeaways that we'll be uh, highlighting is that cyber norms we have today could have been helpful in mitigating um, some of the events of the past. It's really important um, to bring in those affected and that we need greater stakeholder participation, including broadening outside of, of those uh, that we've engaged with in the creation enforcement um, of norms. And um, I think it's, it's where I'm going to leave you uh, for now, because I think we need to wrap up. Um, back to you. 
Thank you very much, Chetal. And um, I'll leave everyone with a few links of where you can find more information about the session today. Also want to say a really, really big thank you to all of the different individuals that you saw um, on stage via Zoom uh, today, and especially the many people in the background that helped with the research this year. They will all be credited and listed in the report, so please do read it. Have a look at the, the very wide group of experts that we have here. We're really blessed to have all of you participate. Um, and I do invite you to look at these documents at the first link on your screen. Um, they're really worth reading, and we are very much inviting your input. And with that, I will actually hand it over to uh, Ion Bomana as uh, one of our BPF on cybersecurity conveners, who's done uh, great work bringing all of us together to, uh, to share some closing words. Thank you, everyone. Well, Martin. Um, this Best Practices Forum has been organized since uh, 2016 and has brought together a group of experts and contributors to investigate the topic of cybersecurity. When the IGF have launched a call for participation at the beginning of the year, experts, researchers, students from all over the world replied to our call. So as a closing remark, I would like to address special thanks to those who have contributed to this BPF on cybersecurity. We know that you volunteer doing this work on top of what you're usually doing, but we are very grateful for that. To close this session, we would expect that uh, the outcome of this session will be a source of inspiration and will be helpful for countries, uh, researchers, state and non-state actors. The documents and uh, research papers are available on the IGF website and already shared by Martin on the, on the Zoom. Thanks a lot and thanks to our audience. The session is now closed. <laughs>